I have been thinking I sit too close because because I get a lot of breathing in there as well. I think a lot of the habits that we established in early whiskey and GameSpot and Maximum PC days probably are bad when you have good microphones because we were using those shitty audio technicas at whiskey and those things you did have to get right up on the 2020s or 2030s. God, that was so long ago. Were those table mics? Those were not headsets. Those are the ones you talk into the side on. I have no memory of that. So I have one right here. My, it's my spare. It's this one. Oh, I don't think we used those. Yeah, we used them in the basement. Did we? We used them in the basement and in the podcast room in the second basement. In the podcast studio? Yeah, you guys, we didn't, you, you guys got the... Did we, is this, did we start? Oh, maybe we did, I don't know. <laughs> this, the, the recording up to now has not had cold open life to it, but now we're on. Yeah, hi, uh, yeah, so in the basement in Sausalito... You guys had an M audio interface that you had to plug your Mac into. Yes. It was really dependent on CPU performance. It was super important that you not do anything else on that computer while you're recording. Wow. And into it, we plugged a table full of Audio Technica AT 2020s or 2030s that are like, they're pretty good. They're like, they're firmly in the great $100, $150 starter mic category for me. Those are startup mics. Yeah. They're like, hey, we want to get microphones, but we don't want to spend four thousand dollars on them and we need like six and also they're pretty indestructible so i I have a picture here if you want to see it it's uh love pictures it's a bit grim oh no the reason i knew how to find it so fast is is the photo i put on the story when ryan passed oh no because i knew it was him sitting in that studio in that basement and on the front street with the microphone (laughs) yeah you can tell it's in the front street part because we were serious about safety there's a fire extinguisher right behind him right that's right. Man, did we really um, have those mics mounted upside down? Yeah, we hung them upside down. I don't know why we did that, but that was <laughs> how you guys had set it up. There's probably a reason. I think it was that it's easier to it was easier to get the right angle on them because you talk into the front of those, not the top. And in order to get the angle with the table mounts we were using that had no shocks on them, you had to you had to tilt it. You had, like you had no throw on the tilt if you if you didn't have it upside down god that's right we had to like be careful about bumping the table those things well yeah because it was the i went to get that table at ikea one day and it was literally the cheapest table that we could get it's the unfinished pine Mm -hmm. kids play table or something maybe i can't remember what it is but it, it was the wobbliest shit i've ever seen rickety to the point that it felt like it was going to collapse at any moment and it's also from the days when Mike boom arms were still really expensive. Like the, the, you could basically, you could only get road, the PSA 100 or whatever, the hundred, the hundred dollar one PSA one PSA one. Yeah. And, uh, we didn't have places to mount them all and jam as many people as we needed to fit into that room. And also they cost as much as the microphones. We definitely weren't spending on money on that. So we, I think we went and got a bunch of kick drum mounts. <laughs> Is that what those are? I think that that's what those are. And they're like $18 each at mm-hmm. Guitar Center or Musician's Friend or something. And uh, like, as long as nobody bumped the table or touched anything, then it didn't make any noise. But as soon as anybody like whacked the table with their leg or something, it would like every bike would rattle and you had to cut that out. Sounds like life at a, start, at a media startup in 2010. It's crazy to think how much more, I mean, we talk about this all the time, but how much more democratized that stuff has become just in the last decade plus in terms of mic stands and microphones themselves and, and audio interfaces and everything. Yeah, the audio interface is the one that blows me away because back then to get a decent audio interface, you had to spend like the M audio was really expensive and it was really not good. Uh, the, the, like your average, um, your average Scarlet or Focusrite Scarlet or Motu or something at this point is going to be so much better and have a buttload of inputs and just like, yeah. And, and the fact that everything has SSDs now instead of hard drives also is a fundamentally like it, it back then you could, if you had, if you tried to record five track, like we could record the tested podcast as individual tracks on that M audio. But I think if you guys did that with the Bombcast with four people or more, it would choke out the hard drive eventually and you just would, it would just, the recording would get laggy and bad. I think that is right. I think, yeah. I, I feel like I want to say when we went back to CBS and got in their fancy recording studio, like having different tracks on different mics or vice versa was yeah. like a huge revelation. <laughs> it's like, oh, we can record each mic on its own now. Being able to record each one independently, it turns out very convenient. Mm-hmm. But, um, and then, and then after that, we got, uh, it tested, we got, um, one of those H fours, the the like the portable audio recorder that could do four tracks independently on an SSD car, on an SD card rather, and we just 
uh, used that for everything at that point because it was really easy and I get, get a fast USB uh, SD card reader for my laptop and suck those files straight in. I have, I have a revelation for you. Yes. Hello. Technology over yes. time, it gets better. The microphone's still really like those, those microphones you all had at CBS still cost the same thing that they did now. The microphone is maybe the one ex- exception there because the RE 20 that I'm using has been the exact same since like the sixties. Yeah, and it gets a little more expensive as as the cost of making it goes up, I guess. Probably. It probably like, used to cost like $18, and now it's $600. Yeah. Oh, this one's like $400, $450, I think. Yeah, I, I, th- I feel like you can get those in the $400, $400, dollars range pretty consistently. It's a hell of a mic, and, and, and it's beige, which I like. That's right. They have a black one now. They, the, like, they belatedly, like just in the last few years, rolled out a black one for streamers, but I defiantly made sure to get the beige mic. Only weirdo posers would have a black uh, RE20. Welcome to Brad and Will made a tech pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. I'm going to close this picture of Ryan sitting here looking at me because it's just going to bum me out. Yeah, it's, I'm kind of kind of bummed. Instead, I'm going to move to the happiest thing on earth. This document full of questions. Hold on. Can I can I can I uh, can I derail the podcast for a second? Yeah, go for it. Hey. Something came up the other day that's from this time period that I think is fun. That's that's cool. But also, I would say I don't think you can derail a podcast because anything else you say in the course of derailing it is just more podcast. Still a podcast. Yeah. So. I've been playing a lot of Helldivers, as I think probably a lot of people have lately, and it got me thinking because I realized I was like a lot of the stuff that makes Helldivers great was also in Magicka in like 2011 when that came out. Oh, yes. I I had forgotten about that until I started playing Helldivers again. But if you go back and look at Magicka, like it's kind of all there. Well, so a I kind of want to go back and play Magicka, but I went back and watched the quick look that you guys did of Magicka. Back when you knew nothing about the game and were like, this is a weird ass game. And like, there's a bazillion ways to kill yourself in it. And it was it was a it was a very fun quick look to go back and watch because also it was from a kinder, gentler time. Mm-hmm. Quick looks were a little different back then. I sure. guess. Yes. Um, but it, I, I got to the end and I had forgotten completely that apparently Mike Horn and I had been playing that a lot because you gave us a shout out at the oh. end of it. Really? For giving you hot strats about how to uh, do stupid shit in in. Uh, magica and i was like oh that's sweet i have i have no recollection of that that sounds like you don't either (laughs) i did not remember that at all um but yeah also looking at the looking at the deck the description on that video after three patches in three days brad and company finally feel safe exploring the realm of magica sounds like sounds like their update cadence also hasn't changed much i think it probably launched pretty hot too in a different way entirely Uh, look when you're breaking new ground the way they are (laughs) The, the entirety of my recollection of that first game is that I loaded it up. I jumped into a game with some friends. I, I assume Mike and some other people. And I immediately launched a laser inside a force bubble, a shield bubble someplace and mm-hmm. murked everybody on this the game and reset the entire game. The the controller in or the, the D-pad input based like spell call downs, the wanton violence against your teammates. Like it's all there. Yep. The, the one the one thing I remember that Helldivers kind of got away from is the spell mixing. Like they had a really dynamic system for like mixing elemental spells with like weather spells with. Bottles, oh, yeah. You know what I mean, it's like, you, like can, you can combine water and yeah. lightning and make make like death puddles for yes, people and stuff yes. like that. You, you yeah. can combine like the fireball spell with a tornado spell to make a fire tornado. Oh. Like it was so cool. Oh, you've not been to Hellmire, I'm guessing. Mm, not yet. Hellmire has fire tornadoes, Brad. Man, I haven't played that game in too long. I've been busy playing 100 Look, hour RPGs. I'm going to go and tell you the JRPGs will still be there, but you yeah. know what won't be? Managed democracy if there's not people defending it. It's true. I you gotta, know what else there won't be if I, we don't uh, get on it? I, I got to do my part in spreading democracy and also answering these questions. Yeah, we got to turn some Q's into A's. It's answers, it's questions, it's emails. Mm-hmm. We're doing all of the above. That's right. If you, if you have a question for the podcast and would like to have it turned into an answer, you can do that one of two ways. One is you can email techpod at content.town. Uh, shout outs to whoever signed us up for the uh, Thailand marketing emails. That was great. They've been blocked. Uh, or even better, you can sign up for the Discord. You can join the Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash techpod and check in the Discord with a bunch of delightful human beings. 
and uh, post your questions in the Q's Seeking A's channel, uh, where it will disappear after a few moments into the ether. But Brad and I will see it at the end of the month. We will make a big list. We will judge them based on their relative merits, and we will answer the ones that we feel interested in answering, and then the rest of them will be saved for later. At some point, we're going to have years worth of questions to answer. Yeah, we've, we've got all these docs, you know, we've... Good questions never die, let's no. say. It's not like we trash any of these old documents. I'm going to scroll back to... Should I read a question from June 2021? Sure, let's see. Why don't people were like, let's look back in the in the mists of time and see what people were interested in oh, June man. of 2021. We are we are getting way more questions now than we did then. <laughs> well, we've been doing questions pretty reliably for the last, you know, three years. So. Sure. Uh, here's a question from Squibworth on June 16th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite robot or cyborg? Some examples are 2D2, Darth Vader, number six. Who's number six? You know, from Battlestar Galactica, oh, the lady. Okay. I have not with seen the red dress. I've not seen Battlestar Galactica. Data, lore, Robocop, Jax, Dot Matrix. Perhaps Ooh. a more interesting question might uh, have to be answered first. How much of your body needs to be artificial to make you a cyborg? Anything. Would a Luke Skywalker with a hand or Picard with a heart count? Yep, 100%. Uh, and does it have to be electronic? Is Ash's hydraulic hand in Army of Darkness good enough? Ooh, I don't know about Ash's hydraulic hand. Yeah, that's. I feel, I feel like that <laughs> that might just make him a heavy metal death machine. Yeah, I I like is Picard's heart robot heart. Does that make him a cyborg? Oh, I don't know. You no. don't see it. No, it's not visible. It's true. It's just an but, organ replacement. Yeah, but like, huh? I feel like I feel like the robot hand absolutely makes you a cyborg, right? Probably. Like I have a, I have a friend who has a a a pump in her liver that uh, blasts chemotherapy stuff out her at her at some bad stuff that's happening to her in her liver every once in a while. I feel like she's probably a cyborg, right? Mm, I guess so. I don't know. I mean, even like Luke's hand, it still just looks like a hand and functions like a hand. I feel like, but, I feel like he can crush marble with that thing though. Yeah, that's like, so. that's an upgrade. I kind of, when I think cyborg, I think overt enhancements of your mm. original, your biological capabilities. If you could like, only enhance one part of you, what would you enhance? Um, Keep it PG, please. Uh, robot eyes. Then. Uh, <laughs> huh. But we like, we've talked, I feel like we've talked about Neuralink enough that I know your stance on Neuralink and mm. that you're probably going to be a, like, there's a, a lot of good reasons to, for that to be a pass. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like, I feel like having a direct internet brain implant would be really really useful i'm not Man. buying it from that guy can you imagine the quality of firewall you would want on that to not let any of the outside internet into your head unbidden yeah probably just not going to click on questionable links and like never forward a port to your brain <laughs> no no yeah best robot has to be r2d2 man mm, definitely R2. the most reliable or the most omnipresent those movies low-key it's just the r2d2 story if they hadn't been cowards, they would have called it the R2-D2 saga when they were rebranding that in the in the J.J. Abrams days. It's true. He's always there. R2-D2 has been my Skywalker. Yes. Always quietly integral to events. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Let's fast forward to the 2024 questions. Wow. What stock should I buy, Brad? Uh, oh, well, I guess I would have needed to know three years ago. Yeah. Sorry. Too am. We are already there. Um, email from... Gerard or Gerard in the Netherlands? I think that's a Gerard. I don't know if they do. They, they do. They it's, do soft. It's not. It's Gerard Depardieu. He's French. He's French is, is Dutch, I guess. Do they, so do they do, do they similar. Do, yeah. Do they do soft G's in Dutch? I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I'm sure we'll find out after this episode goes up. I, I don't. I know they don't German, but anyway. Um, all right. Uh, back in the day, screensavers were actually useful since they prevented prevented burn in on CRT monitors, which is not really a concern nowadays. However, they were also fun. So why did we stop having fun? Uh, would you consider, or sorry, would you reconsider using a fun screensaver? There's a dedicated community making sure Johnny Castaway still runs on modern machines, for instance. Man, I love a good screensaver. Yeah, I miss screensavers terribly. Um, I still use them. What? Really? I mean, not for their purpose, but like... Oh. I have, even though I still, even though I work in my house now and there's somebody else around, I still have the office instinct of have my workstation lock itself after like five minutes after wow. I walk away. Did you never do that? I mean, I did when I worked in an office and yeah. I was working with a bunch of reprobates, but like, I, like I wouldn't ever do that at home. I just have it go straight to this display, go straight to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. 
I do that. I mean, I do that too, but in the end, I mean, the reason we stopped is because of the power usage. It turns out like with a, a billion plus PCs in the world, if we all just ran screensavers all the time, uh, we would do bad things yeah. to the amount of power. Like we're, we, we don't want to be mining Bitcoin over here. That's true. I mean, that's getting better with OLED though. If you were to, if you were to use a sufficiently darkened screensaver, that would use relatively little power. In fact, I was researching screensavers a few weeks ago, like trying to find out what is still available for windows. Uh-huh. And I saw a bunch of people saying like, Hey, if you have an OLED, can't you just display a black frame without actually turning the monitor off? And it's kind of the same thing. Hmm. Wow. Is that actually the case? I'm sure, I'm sure there's some extra electronics that are still alive or, or not in a suspend state in yeah. the monitor that are make, maybe taking a little more power, but like, but that is compelling. Yeah. Like the display itself wouldn't be their, their argument there was like, then you don't have to wait for it to come out of sleep and like warm back up or come back on. Although it doesn't really have to warm up, but you know what I mean? Like it would be instant when you move your mouse, the screen would hmm. come back from black because it was technically still on and displaying. I mean, uh, yeah. They, so there's going to be electronics in the, in the set that are pulling juice all the time, but, but yeah, it wouldn't be as much. I, for me, it's like, it was worse in the in the CRT days, obviously, because CRTs used kind of a lot of power. The cold cathode backlights were were notoriously power hungry. Now it just feels kind of wasteful. And it turns out I I set everything to be dark when it's not running now, too. So I just turn those lights off. Um, I I had an old fish tank screensaver that had like tropical fish in it that I absolutely loved, though. That's a great and, one. Uh, yeah, I would I would do that again. Was that Mac OS that had that one built in? That one, I bought a special piece of software. It was one of the first things I bought on the internet, actually, I think. Like 20 bucks. You could buy extra fish later. Pay for screensavers? Look, I, you know, those people made, they spent the time modeling those fish. That's fair. That's fair. Nothing nothing will ever top the heyday of like roughly the year 2000. Every single computer in the entire dorm had the Matrix screensaver going on it. Oh, that's funny. The, for me, it, when I was in college, it was the After Dark Toasters was what yeah. everybody had. And Pipe Dream. Yeah. Pipe Dream was a good one. I, I, if I had, like, if I had solar that was generating more power than I use, I would consider probably flipping that on. But with the electric car and all that, I don't think that's realistic. Yeah, fair. Also, you know, monitors have a finite lifespan. Like, sure. burn, burn in or not. You know, these, like, backlights on LCDs get dimmer over time. Like, OLEDs have their own kind of burn in, like, uh, pixel aging issues. It's, it's kind of, it kind of bums me out. Cause like I look at like those Samsung frame TVs and stuff like that. And I'm like, this is really cool. It's neat that you can have ambient art up on the wall when you're not doing it, but it does use some amount of power and it's, it just, it just, I don't know. It feels wasteful to have something on that you're not actively using. Yeah. I was just reading about this year's TV and the, the Samsung frames this year now have a new 60 Hertz mode. <laughs> yeah. Which I guess they didn't have before, but they dropped the refresh rate or at least optionally on the new models to use less power because it refreshes less. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't do what, what, what like the Apple watch does and give you like a, maybe not a one Hertz mode, but at least something super low. If you're displaying a still image. I, you know, that took Apple a fair amount of time to get there too. So yeah, fair. Um, and, and power for the Apple watch is a direct response on battery life, which is one of the prime motivators for customers. Yes. Whereas on the Samsung thing, I think the people who are buying TVs that expensive, maybe don't give a shit about their power bill. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll say about screensavers, there is a truly amazing L cars screensaver out there. The oh, Star yeah. Trek computer interface, but it's kind of hard to integrate with windows and it kind of uses a lot of <laughs> compute to run. Yeah, I don't want my GPU spinning up when my CPU, when my screensaver comes on. That's yeah. the opposite of what I'm going for. I can't remember the name of it, but you could probably find it pretty easily if you Google for it. Anyway, um, quick email from Rob here about the uh, old Disney World VR thing we talked about a few weeks ago. Ooh, the um, uh, Aladdin Quest, I think is what it's yes. called. Or VR, uh, yeah, Aladdin Quest. Uh, Rob says we got at least a couple. We got, we got multiple emails on this. Yes. Yeah, yeah we, had to, we had to land on one and it's this one. Uh, back in the heady days of the 90s, a buddy and I drove down from Ohio to Disney World to see and do all the nerdy Disney things that they, they had on offer. Uh, when we went to Epcot, specifically the area called Communicor at the time. Communicor sounds... That sounds cool. Pretty heavy metal in itself. Uh, we waited for the VR demo and I was picked to try it. Uh, there were two components. The headset that was counterbalanced by some overhead rigging and the device you sat on straddling it like a motorcycle. You leaned forward and grabbed some controls on the unit. Uh, The premise was that you were Aladdin riding the magic carpet, trying to exit the Cave of Wonders, if I recall correctly. Guided by Iago the parrot, you raced the other two volunteers in a timed demo. I thought it was pretty darn cool. 
Uh, a few years later, when Disney opened up Disney Quest in Orlando, they had an attraction based on this. Same text, same story, just more polished, and you got a score at the end. It was at Disney Quest for quite some time, as I remember. That's, uh, so we got a lot of emails about this. Um, the big things that I thought were interesting are the counterbalanced, like the, the, the helmets hung from the head, the ceiling, and were counterbalanced because they were so heavy because I assume they had giant CRTs in them. Yeah, I don't think I, I think I had that thought when we talked about this on the tech demo episode and didn't actually voice it that, yeah, they would have had to have straight up CRTs strapped to your face, right? Yeah, because LCDs at that time weren't color and weren't bright. There were some laptops that had color LCDs, but they were all reflective screen so you had to have a front light on them and you couldn't that wouldn't work for vr um another person did the demo and talked about how uh only uh three people got to like so this was the shipping version of the game this was what was it uh, like in the actual park the preview that we saw the video of was a thing where like they would pull three people out of the audience who got to try the ride and everybody else watched them and it seems like they didn't have like the motorcycle style thing to sit on. They just sat on like a flat area and had people like keeping them from falling off of it, basically. Um, so, yeah, it sounds cool. I would love to. I wish I wonder if somebody I, I looked a little bit to see if somebody did a recreation of any of that in um, or, or, or ported whatever they'd done forward uh, to run on modern headsets. But I couldn't find anything. So. Uh, it seems like a thing that would be desirable for the uh, video game preservation folks. Oh, uh, for sure. I didn't even thought about that. I wonder if I wonder if the Frank Cifaldi's of the world have a lead on something like that. Well, I bet Disney I bet Disney even keeps their very old stuff pretty tightly under lock and key. Y- yeah, I mean, the thing about there's a lot of people that preserve like park stuff. So like if you want to go see what it was like to ride one of the old rides, there's tons and tons and tons of video that people have recorded. Um, but there's not like the software for that stuff is a little bit like. I mean, it was obviously proprietary. It was run on closed machines. It was probably run on like SGI machines or something really weird back then. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. My my YouTube recommendations have gotten extremely SGI-ified recently. Ooh, what, what have you been looking at? Like, I, they just, stuff just started showing up. I mean, I've been watching a lot of like old video game console restoration videos and stuff like that. Mm. So, like, somebody showed up on there with an SGI Onyx. Um, somebody had a, was, was there an, it's not an uh, Octane, I believe is one of them. Yeah, Octane was um was it a mid tier, a, a mid mid era SGI workstation? It was a big giant chonky boy though. It was like yeah. a yeah. Most of them, most of theirs looked like like little mid towers that were kind of purple and cool. Yes, yes. But the Octane was a big workstation thing that came in like a it was like a crate. Teal. I think it's yeah, like teal. I'm looking at a picture of it now. The Onyx. It's a guy on there that got his hands on an Onyx, and he has like a bunch of the documentation and like ads from the time. The Onyx started at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and went up to six fifty. Oh, the Onyx is what I'm thinking about. So the Octane was the small one. So the Onyx they didn't even advertise as a uh, workstation; they advertised it as a graphics supercomputer. <laughs> yeah, because it was the, literally the fastest graphics hardware on the planet at the time. The Onyx was really, really, really big. Yeah, yes, yeah, so it's at got least like the first ones. He, he pulls the case apart, and you can see how it's like built out of metal, and it had like metal runners on the side because it was too. It has wheels. It was too big and heavy to lift. You had to roll it around because it was so damn big. It looks a lot like old mini computers. If you're if um, like if you look for like a weighing weighing microcomputer or weighing mini computer, uh, then they they were the same kind of big thing. But this wasn't a shared uh, shared terminal like no. a weighing would have been. Yeah, I'll I'll try to remember to link that video in the show notes for this. It's pretty fascinating if you are interested in <laughs> old computers that used to cost half a million dollars. Yeah, I, I uh, love a half million dollar computer. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, all right. One more email from Luke in Oregon. Uh, I just finished fil- building my first PC on my own. Congratulations. Uh, it was awesome and super fulfilling, but since then I'm plagued with anxiety about my build. Did I miss something? Is something going to just break and I'll have to spend a, a month getting my motherboard RMA'd? Alltech has a shelf life and runs into problems, problems that are often costly and or time consuming. So here's my question for you. How do you make peace with the reality the tech is going to have problems? How do you manage the inevitable frustration and annoyances that come with technology? I um, just buy two of everything. So that is something. To, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so most places that you're buying computer hardware from now, if you have something that conks out, you can give them a credit card number and they'll cross ship stuff and then only charge you if you don't return the broken piece. So um, like when my Intel CPU conked out and I had to RMA it, it went back. 
uh, th- it was back three days after I sent it out. Right. Like I, I got it almost immediately. Sometimes you can even get it before you, um, the, sorry, the replacement was here three days after I asked for them to send me a replacement. And then I sent the, the, the old one back. Um, so it's not, it's not like it's, you're not going to be out for a month, uh, unless you're in Australia or New Zealand or someplace that's far away from places and overnight shipping is less of a, a available for you. Yeah. I, I mean, usually once it's up and running, you're probably pretty good. Like the stuff that you and I have had problems with this year is the, is, is the na- anomaly in my experience. Uh, yeah. My, the compatibility my, issues and stuff are not the stuff we've been running into. Not, not super common. Yeah. It's, it's not been, um, it's, it's really, really not been an issue. Like my, I'm trying to think my, like my 9900 K machine, I basically built and was rock solid for four years, five years. My, um, my machine prior to that, the Broadwell E lasted is still it's on the garage. It was, it became a server and ran 24 seven after it had been my desktop computer for three or four years. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I famously used that 7700 K for, well, I did swap CPUs and Ram at one point, but like that thing went from 2016 to last year, 27 years. Like I I've, I've been extraordinarily lucky with uh, hardware failure over time. I've had like one motherboard in my entire life die. Um, yeah, like generally motherboards and stuff don't die. The yeah. memory sometimes will conk out, but as long as you're not at the end of that memory lifespan, like that that type of memory's lifespan, generally it's pretty inexpensive to replace memory. Yeah. I wonder um, if do memory makers still do lifetime warranties? I did have one Corsair stick of like DDR3 maybe, like from like 10 years ago go bad, but like at that point I just pulled it out and sent it in and they sent me a new one and I just had half the RAM for a week or two. Depending on the RAM, you'll either get two years or 10 years or maybe somebody has lifetime. I don't know. I, I've usually by the time memory conks out in my machines, new memory is faster and bigger. And I just upgrade when that yeah. happens. I, th- I think that's the real lesson here is that generally, like unless you have a dead or like a dead on arrival situation, something that is like faulty out of the factory, like you're probably going to be fine until the point that you kind of don't care that it's dead anymore. You know, like once it, like you said. Once it dies, it makes more sense to just replace it with something new. Yeah. Like if I, when I had eight gigs of DDR or conk out or 16 gigs of DDR four, I just bought a 32 gig kit to replace it. Cause I, I wanted more memory anyway, by that point. Yeah. And it turns out adding more memory is an easy way to get a little more juice out of an older machine. So yeah, yeah. the thing, the thing I have less uh, success dealing with, or the thing that I let get to me more than failures, like failures or whatever, like you said, they're fact of life. Like you just deal with them. The thing that drives me crazy is just like shit design in something that I'm now stuck with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I got these new monitors uh, like three or four years ago. There are like two, three things about these monitors that drive me crazy to this day. And there's just nothing I can do about it because that's just how they're made. And it was by the time it was really a problem, I kind of couldn't get rid of them anymore. It was too late to send them back. Like stuff well, like stuff like the auto input select on these things can't be oh. turned off. And when I'm streaming and trying to like swap inputs to turn a console on, you know, having the monitor decide what it thinks I should be looking at when I'm trying to tell it or, you know, trying to turn stuff on and switch things efficiently while I'm live on the internet, just infuriating. Like that's the kind of stuff that bums me out is just stuff that doesn't work like it should because somebody made a dumb design decision. I I have um, my water cooler uh, reports temperature back in to fan control and whatever other software you've installed. It was great, except for when the computer goes to sleep, it it bombs out that connection and it doesn't recover gracefully. So I had to restart fan control every time the computer rebooted. I just replaced the water cooler. Yeah, like it was annoying. And that's yeah. Sometimes you just have to rip the band. I, I, I typically don't let myself do that, but there are absolutely cases where I should have where it's like I should just sell or give this away and buy a new one that I'm happier with <laughs> just to eat the money because this is driving me nuts. Well, so ultimately I'll put it in another machine yeah. that can benefit from having the water temperature monitoring, uh, but that doesn't sleep. It's only on when it's being used. So it's, you know, it's less of an issue. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's the plan there, I guess. Yes. All right. Here's a good question from one sweet Chuck on the discord. I think there are two versions of this question that we should consider. Um, what happens if Google actually decides to shutter Gmail? What happens to the world and what should people do to protect against such a future? So I think they're like the two versions of this question are what is the realistic scenario where Google would actually shut Gmail down, which like probably isn't a realistic situation to begin with. And in that, in that case, you know, there's probably months or even years of ramp up to that and warnings and stuff. The other version of this is Gmail just vanishes one day. Yeah. Like what if Gmail breaks? Well, boy, I I don't even want to think about that. I, I think you just start at the beginning and start. uh, 
you start changing, you have to start, hopefully you have a password manager mm-hmm. and you know, all the places you have accounts that are tied to that Gmail account by searching for that Gmail account in your password manager. Yes. And then start going in and changing those accounts. But I mean, woof, what a nightmare. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm thinking about this in, in the like science fiction way of like, you know, what, what if cell phones all vanished one day, you know, like that kind of thing. Like if I, I, I bet there would be a pretty measurable disruption to like business and daily, daily, whatever, you know, daily life. Um, if suddenly nobody had a Gmail account anymore, there, there are enough businesses like we often is a bad practice, but we often would set up like Google accounts that are tied to YouTube channels and stuff like that, that have significant business businesses attached to them that are hooked into a free Gmail account instead of one that's attached to our domain and corporate accounts, just because then the corporate IT folks aren't managing them and do nothing against corporate IT folks, but often you'll, you're like, you don't want to be in a situation where the person who's in charge of the IT, the email addresses for the corporate domain is like, Oh, what's this, what's this, you know, blog at blah, blah, blah. And then they delete your blog stop plot blog. That's the back end for your entire website or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I, 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 man, I don't even, like if they shut, if they're going to sunset Gmail, it's probably in the real world. If they're going to sunset Gmail, it's because they're going to move everybody to something else. Right. Yeah. And if they're going to do that, there's going to be a long ramp period. It's not like they're going to say, oh, OK, then the end of three months, we're turning off Gmail. Good luck. But millions of assholes, because it's it, it is kind of they have kind of, I think, intentionally built email for most people on the Internet. Yes. At least in our market. I'm sure that there's other things in other places. God, I wonder what the market share is at this point, actually. I bet it's, it's enormous. Probably very stupid. It's yes. a very large number. Yeah. Uh, actually, on that subject, here's another question from Meatball that is in the same vein. Uh, I've been using the same email address that's my first initial and last name at Outlook.com for nearly 15 years after having abandoned the same setup at Gmail.com due to it becoming a spam nightmare. Unfortunately, the last year or two on Outlook has gone the same path, and 20-plus spam messages are getting past whatever junk mail filters they have per day. Uh, it's, it's to the point that I'm considering going with a new email address, even though that would mean updating an insane amount of website logins and figuring out how to, or even, or even if I should, get the word out to people I've emailed in the past 10, 15 years. Uh, what do you all consider the best email service now in general and in, regar- in regards to spam filtering? And would you still stick with your name and the email address or come up with something else? I'm never putting my name in an email address again. Yeah, I'm not either, except if it's like a front facing like business address that I give to people that I work with and at other companies that need to yeah. know who I am and who that address goes to. But like, yeah, for for private emails that have financial stuff or health stuff or whatever attached to them, like absolutely as obscure as possible. <laughs> I literally for the one that has all of my banking and stuff attached to it, I literally opened up my password manager and had it generate a three word phrase like passphrase with three random words. And that's my email address for important stuff. Yeah, that's good. Um, the, the, the spam that happens just from having first name, last name on popular email services is such that you can, I don't think you can realistically do that. I think you have to do uh, some word and numbers. Uh, and then there's a problem. Like for example, when you're on a job hunt, I, I just registered another domain and hooked an email address up for that. That's just for that, just for the job hunt. So all the applications go out to a specific new email address. I, it's a pain in the ass because you have to make sure it fits all this anti-spam stuff. You have to do the TKIP. I think it's TKIP. I can't remember. I had to set up a, a whole bunch of authentication with Google. I had to make a Google admin console for that domain so that so that I would be able to get to people on Google and Microsoft and and um, other corporate email clients. Yeah, I think I think that's a good option. It's not actually that hard for most people to do. I mean, of course, you just said there is some management there, but uh, controlling your own domain has some advantages. You know, you could change email providers down the road and keep the same address if you want. Yeah. For the, the other thing on the, so on their note, I literally wouldn't use email to talk to people anymore. <laughs> Oh, interesting. All right, I mean, sure. like when was like, I don't, I get emails with bills. I get emails with, um, like documents, like 401k stuff and things like that. Oh yeah. 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 But I like when, I don't think I sent an email to a family member that wasn't about bills or 401k stuff or some family business or something in like 10 years. 
Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you know, like my landlord still uses email to contact tenants. Yeah. For example, I mean, I use email every day for to talk to people in the industry at companies, but that's just like official that's business. Work. Yeah, that's a different thing. Um, yeah, and, and maybe, maybe you're right. I it's, it's funny in the games industry, I find myself using Discord and like, I mean, I still unfortunately the reason I still have a Twitter account is because people still use Twitter DMs almost mm-hmm. constantly. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. Um, as for other services. People I, like Proton Mail. Yeah, like Proton Mail is pretty well liked for encryption. I, I can't speak to how effective their spam filtering is. I'm sure it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I switched to Hay before we realized that the people that run Basecamp kind of suck, and now I'm stuck they, on it. Yeah, they're bad. Um, I, I uh, what's um, let's look at the Ruby on Rails guy, David Hanemeyer David, Hansen. Yeah, he's bad. I, I, I read, I've read his blog occasionally as I've dipped in in and out of interesting. I topics so, related to web frameworks and programming languages, but the problem for me is that my email address is a first name, last name at Gmail and I, their filtering method, which is just like, once you allow something, it goes to your inbox and everything else just gets filtered away. Turns out to be pretty effective against the problems that come with having a 20 plus year old Gmail inbox. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't feel great about giving them money every year. Fair. That is fair. Um, email, it'll never not be somewhat fraught. Email sucks. Yeah. Email's bad. I'm kind of surprised there hasn't been so well. It's, that's such a thorny topic. Like how would you replace email as a standard with something better? I don't know. Google tried it. Yeah. I don't know. I like, I, I don't think that there's a great, like, I don't particularly like outlook.com. I think it's, I think it sucks for all the reasons that outlook sucks. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like I think like to fully properly replace email, you would need something that was end to end encrypted, which email extremely is not. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that ship probably sailed a long time ago. I feel like there. I feel like intelligence. I feel like a lot of people would have feelings about end to end encrypted email. Yes, probably so. Yeah. Um, here's a question from T three eight five two one nine. That's a good email address right there. Mm hmm. Uh, do you have any insight into how companies like AWS, Azure, or Google decide where to open new data centers? What criteria are important? Is it just electricity cost, water supply? Are there places with better access to the internet pipes? At a certain level, do they do they want distributed location close to where population density is? So they have spreadsheets. And they put in things like the cost per kilowatt hour of electricity and the amount of water and the average temperature and the amount of sunlight that, that those sites are going to get yeah. on the day to day. Yeah. I would, I will also assume straight up cost of like real estate and land is a big deal because data centers they have a gigantic footprint. They're large um, things like whether they're seismically active areas or whether they're subject to hurricanes or tornadoes or, or severe weather events are, are things that they are, they're concerned about. Um, and uh, then then I'm sure that everybody has different formulas that they use. Uh, but I guess proximity to fiber is probably also important, although probably less so now because like at the scale that these data centers run at, they probably just run whatever they need. Um, but yeah, it's it's like Oregon was really popular for a while because there's cheap hydroelectric power from the Columbia River. There's the temperatures nice and uh, the climate is temperate. It's not particularly seismically active. There's no hurricanes. There's not really significant winter storms. There's no uh, uh, there's fire risk, I guess, but that's relatively manageable. Um, I think from a risk management perspective, so it's about risk and cost. Yeah. Another one I didn't think to mention. Did we mention possible tax incentives? I assume I assume some of those might exist as well. Yeah, I guess so. I, I, I mean, know, I don't know. I don't that, know. Like, I don't know why you'd incentivize that because it's not like it generates a lot of jobs. Eh, maybe not that many jobs, but I mean, you are bringing high skilled labor tech labor to the area are you i mean there's like three people in there just hit the button every once in a while i don't know i mean i I think there's a lot of construction jobs when they're building them but i feel like once that's done it's just a kind of pimple on your on your infrastructure otherwise because it uses a lot of power and generates a lot of heat yeah uh google google has a data center in north carolina not far from where i was born or grew up rather that makes sense yes it's cool in the mountains uh yeah relatively Uh, few natural disasters do you remember when microsoft was building those containerized data centers that they were sinking in the bay maybe yeah. that was google yes no that was microsoft I, the i the image will never leave my head of them pulling one of those out of the water with like barnacles all over the side because it had the very bright one microsoft logo the four color oh yeah window pane logo on it <laughs> except the thing was covered with the detritus of the sea 
And that was after like two years or something or a year. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about thermal pollution from data centers. In fact, actually, I do know how I feel about it. It feels bad. Yeah, it's a it's not great. Uh, it's not great. I mean, but at the same time, we're like right now, there's a there's a bunch of coastal um, like wave generation, tide generation trials going on that seem really promising and have. Are, I mean, I guess ultimately, when you take energy from the tides, you're slowing the rotation of the Earth, probably in some mm. infinitesimal amount. Sure. Pro- this is a problem for future us. Yeah. Um, I, I like I feel like coastal stuff is probably good, but the weather on coastal areas is getting worse and worse. So I, I don't know. So it's a weird situation. Like some people build data centers in Arizona because there's free solar power, like mm-hmm. massive, massive free solar power there. So yeah. but what do I know? But it's also pretty warm. So it is very hot in the summer. Yeah. A lot of air conditioning there. Yes. Question from Park. Why are so many companies so slow to recognize the WebP file type in their software? Is there a business or technical reason why this would be difficult? It seems odd to see slow adoption of what will clearly be the next widespread image file type. Like browsers and stuff supported WebP almost immediately. Yeah, browsers have supported WebP forever. I, I thought for a long time it was a licensing issue, but I looked it up and WebP is licensed under a BSD license, which that should not be a problem. Yeah, um, I, I feel like for a lot, like in the old days with open open formats like that that were licensed to that, I think there was worry about license contamination. Um, like if you had a GPL'd format and you supported it with GPL'd libraries in your code, then you then have to GPL other code that that code touches, and that's a that's a slippery slope. Um, it's not a real concern with BSD licenses, that was my understanding. Yeah. Um... I know, I know WebP is huge in web development. My understanding is WebP's compression is incredibly efficient for the quality. In fact, is it lossless? I think it is. It can I, be, is I, my, is my. Like, I'd, I've, I've followed some conversations. On, it's funny, like, this will pop up on Twitter occasionally where a bunch of people will grouse about how much they hate WebP and then every web designer in the world will pop up and be like, the web would not work as it does without WebP. Like, the numbers of extra terabytes of data we would have to move daily. Uh if we were not using a file or an image format, this efficient would be basically be unsustainable. Yeah. So WebP has both lossless and lossy formats. According to Google's WebP fact sheet, it's 26% smaller in size compared to pings and 25 to 34% smaller than comparable JPEGs at the equivalent quality yeah. index. And it supports transparency, which is yes. the other big deal. Yes. And if you think about the, the, the number of like nice site designs you'll see out there, like every company, every professional, anything on the web needs graphics that don't have compression artifacts that need to look clean and, you know, and also have transparency. Yeah. And professional. And so you need, you need some nice, nice, efficient, lossless format for that. So, um, um, like Adobe didn't support WebP for a long time, which I think is just Adobe being always eternally slow to support new file formats, partly because until the file format is big enough to be worthy of support, Adobe doesn't support it. And until Adobe supports stuff, often the file formats have a hard time getting big enough to demand support. So yeah. like it's a weird circular argument there. Yeah. According according to this Wikipedia chart, uh, Illustrator and Photoshop got support around end of 2021, beginning of 2022. So it hasn't been it's just been a couple of years basically since Adobe <laughs> actually finally adopted WebP. As opposed to say Chrome getting support in what, like 2012 or 2013 yeah, or like something? All, all the browsers have had it for a decade plus. But I mean, that's the workflow problem people run into is they get an image in a web browser they can view and then they try to save it and realize they can't open it with anything local and that's where people get mad but don't blame don't blame the image format it's not the fault of the image format it's i assume it's it's just like other than maybe adobe's case where they're just being sluggish for market dominance like lack of demand probably like it's just not used in the professional world outside of like the people doing web development already have the tools they need to work with it look all i know is that i pay adobe is uh, every year a bunch of money for continuously updated software and it then they are the last people that supported the new format yeah right yeah. Uh, same thing happened with heic which is apple's proprietary thing for for um uh uh video like short form video and and images right and like you you have to still jump through hoops to support heic and creative cloud yeah today is my yes. understanding yeah uh, i don't i don't know if i don't know if it's accurate to say that webp is the, is the image format of the future because there's a bunch of other competing next generation file formats or image formats out there as well there's jpeg xl 
which I think has a fair amount of momentum behind it and has a lot of advantages. Uh, there's there's AVIF. Have you seen those? Yeah, AVIFs. Yes, yes AVIFs, AVIF. I don't know. Those have now taken the place of WebP for me um, in terms of images that I Google search up and grab to use for some stupid purpose and then can't open locally. Mm. Um, Cause like I use affinity photo and it supports WebP and HEIC just fine, but it will not open AVIS or at least version one will not. So, so the funny thing on the HEIC front to get HEIC support in windows, you still have to download the HEIC and HEVC support tools from the Microsoft store and then restart Photoshop. So they needed it at OS level, not at, oh. um, at Photoshop level. Oh, they're, they're even, just not paying the licensing for it. Did this what's even, happened. Okay. It didn't even click for me that H E I C was related to H E V C in some way. Yeah. They're two sides of the same coin, um, right? Yeah. Apparently A V I F is part of A V one. Like it's from the Alliance for open media who has made A V one, the royalty free next gen video codec file mm. formats. I'm sure plenty of people's eyes glaze over, but I find them very interesting. <laughs> I, I I quite enjoy it. It's always fun. Yeah. Um, if you really want a fun evening, like dig way into the spec for a file format sometime and look at like the byte order for stuff and what the headers have to look like. If you really want to know what what is inside a file. I think not, I'm probably appear, okay, it turns you, out. You appear to be nodding off. I'm I'm look, it's I've been the been the doors closed. CO2 levels probably around a thousand in here. It's it's getting a little drowsy. Uh you want to do a couple more? Yeah. Uh spells. As a question, why are technology companies allergic to the number nine? No Windows nine, no iPhone nine, et cetera. Um, nine is an unlucky number in certain markets. Yeah, there, I, that, that is probably the case. Um, I, I looked up in these two particular cases. In the case of Windows nine, like the, the prevailing theory seems to be that Windows eight was such a boondoggle that Microsoft just wanted an extra clean break from it. And 10 is a good long distance from eight. Um, there's also, there's also, this is, this is totally apocryphal. I've never seen any direct evidence of this. There's always been the idea floating around that like a bunch of, a bunch of like old windows APIs and stuff. Legacy software has got like the string windows nine for 95 or 98 in it or the broadly that it would cause some, it would cause some cause windows a bunch of 2k problem. Yeah. Uh, cause, yeah. Yes. Yeah, cause a bunch of confusion with, with old code. Um, so the thing I, I was told uh, by someone who was around at the time is that nine is unlucky is a bad number in Japan. Cause it's a, it's a homophone for the word for suffering in mm. the same way that four is, is a number you don't use in China Yeah, uh, because it's uh, I, I don't remember what the word in China in, in uh, I assume Cantonese, but I don't know. Anyway, probably Mandarin if it's like official. Okay. Um, yeah, that's possible. I mean, you know, they don't they don't put floor 13s in a lot of American elevators. So I, I guess I look, I think really realistically, the reason Windows 10 was Windows 10 and not Windows 9 is because Microsoft had been looking at OS 9 or OS 10 for a decade. Yeah. And it was like, we got to catch up. I am Our sure there's lower than theirs. I am sure that's part of it. Um, kind of the same thing with the iPhone 10. Like, I, I think it was I think that was the 10th anniversary of the first iPhone when the 10 the iPhone it was, 10 came yeah. out. And I'm sure, you know, they also changed it to the Roman numeral X. Which oh, also, no, no, it was after the 10th anniversary of the first it? iPhone, wasn't it? When did when did the iPhone 10 come out? Oh, no, maybe not. It was when I was doing Foo uh, stuff. Yeah, no, it was. It was, yeah. 2017? Uh, so yeah, it was 10 years. Okay, um, so yeah. And and they had synergy with the Roman numeral 10 on the on OS 10 at the time. So I, I think in both of those cases, it was probably more marketing driven than anything else. Well, and also it was the first major like redesign, right? It was the first time they yeah. got rid of the button screen. Like it was. A, yes. For the, the iPhone in particular, wasn't that the first OLED model or no? Did they tend to have OLED screens? I don't know if it was OLED, but it was the one with the, it was the first one with a notch. It was the first yeah. one without, with the swipe. It was the first one with face ID. Yeah. It was a huge um, design, design change. It was, it was a return to the metal band around the edge, which was, you know, kind of the iconic iPhone four design. Yeah. Um, the, it's funny we're as a as a people's willingness to trash branding that has worked really well for a long time right now is at an all-time high i think i saw um i mean obviously hbo max becoming just max and ditching the thing that's like the probably the most respected brand in 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 like in like uh, premium tv for the last 40 years is a real real remarkable one somebody was talking about one in the discord this morning that i hadn't realized oh polycom 
H H uh, HP bought Polycom and is ditching the Polycom branding. What is now, Polycom? Polycom made headsets, like really good headsets. Huh. And um, they had Poly.com, which is uh, you know, it's a it's a good URL. Yeah, it is. And now that just redirects to like some page on HP site where they sell uh, Polycom headsets, which is a bummer. There's there's nothing worse than the amazing domain being subsumed into just a corporate redirect. Yep. Set that thing free. Yeah. Let, well, I mean, I, let somebody I guess do that, something with it. And by somebody, I mean me. That's phase three of this plan. They're going to sell it for hundreds of thousands of dollars, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, question from Man, Man, Mangix, Mang, Mangix. I'm not sure how you would. Mangix. Yeah. Mangix. Uh, would you recommend an EV if you don't have a reliable way to charge it at home, an apartment without chargers, for example? Uh, it depends. So if the if you have a, if it's a modern EV that charges pretty fast, uh, like I would totally also you have to have chargers near you that are accessible. So, for example, a thing that's been happening in L.A. lately is a lot of the grocery stores have a handful of Electrify America chargers in their in their parking lots. Totally. In that situation, you live near a grocery store that's served. Totally would do that. Yeah. Um, if you uh, don't, we even have in San Francisco. They're like there's the the. Lucky at uh, Sloat has chargers now, as does the Safeway at Noriega. So like there are there are, you know, it's it's becoming more accessible even in urban areas. Uh, so if you have a car like like we're getting ready to pick up a new Ionic tomorrow, actually, a le- a, our lease expired on the Bolt. So it's time for a new car. And uh, that thing charges from zero to 80 percent, like 20 minutes. Wow. Which means you can go in to get a car, go get your groceries. And by the time you come out, your car's full again. Oh, man, that's great. Yeah, I'm totally on board for that. Wow. That's cool. Um, yeah. Like I, I read this question and at first I was like, why in the world would you want to do this? And then I was like, oh, wait, right. People would go and get gas. Still. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not that different. I mean, you know, like to me, that that is a big advantage of an electric car is you can charge it at home. But but I guess giving that up is not the end of the world if you can do it in a way that fits into your lifestyle similar to the way that getting gas does. Well, yeah. And and like the weird thing is like we've lived on the bolt on the, on the 120 volt charger, the level one charger the entire time, which charges at eight or 12 uh, amps, I guess Is that right. Amps Watts. I don't know. Uh, yeah, amps. Uh, and, and like it, that will trickle assuming we don't drive more than like 250 or 300 miles in a week, which sounds like it's, it's weird. Cause like when I lived in Tennessee, Driving 250 miles in a week would be a really light week of driving here. Driving 250 miles a week means I went and visited somebody in Petaluma maybe twice. Right. Um, Which is a lot of it's a lot of driving just because everything's so condensed here. Uh, So, yeah, I like I I don't everybody's different. I wouldn't buy like a bolt that only charges at 50 kilowatts per hour um, and and expect to charge that on commercial charges because it'll make you crazy. But a more modern, faster charging car is going to be fine, especially if you have chargers near you. Yeah. Um, let's see. A couple more here. How about uh, Braven Bark? It is 5.11 a.m. And I just found out the Cooler Master HAF XB Evo is no longer available on Amazon because it is old and discontinued. Uh, I was looking to purchase one for an Unraid server. I believe this is the best case ever. It has handles, a uh, wide stance for easy college dorm moving while an undergrad and safer during transit, six hard drive bays, room for fans galore. What is your favorite case and why? Do you have a favorite case for unsexy, tucked away, home lab server stuff? Uh, can I shout out the Corsair Carbide series, which went the way of the Dodo uh, earlier, I guess, two years ago? Okay. The the 330R was a quiet mid tower, all black, no windows, no no holes. Uh, fan grills were blocked by screens, so you could dust them easily and get to them very very easily. And it had a door that covered up the drive bays in the front. So, uh, yeah, they don't sell those anymore either. I'm pumped about it. Yeah, I'm looking at pictures. That looks pretty similar to some of the fractal offerings, like the the defined the defined ones in particular. It does. It's, I mean, there's a period of time. It's like the, these were from the early 2010s when, when, you know, black aluminum was very, was all the rage and like it has punch outs on the back for water cooling loops. If you want to hang your radiator off the back instead of uh, on the inside or, you know, whatever it's, it was a very functional mid tower. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I can name a favorite that I would actually like recommend. Like 
my favorites are going to be the ones that I'm nostalgic for. <laughs> you know, nobody should get an Antec P180 anymore. And that was a good case too. If, if you could even find one, but man, I used that thing for like 12 years. That was a pretty solid case. It was a good case. Um, yeah, I've been pretty happy with the last couple of fractal defines that I've used. Like the so a couple spots, the build quality is not totally top notch, but pretty pretty good design accommodating overall. Uh, I did move my NAS into the Define R6 last fall, mm-hmm. and I've put these 7200 RPM drives in it, and it leaks sound like I want to stab my ears with ice picks sometimes. No. <laughs> It's the, like the high, the, I, I've actually been meaning to record it and see what frequency the hum is that comes out of those drives. Yeah. To see if you can cancel it's, it out. It is a, it is a very specific high frequency hum that is coming through the, I think it's the, this, it has a removable top panel for where you can put like fan grills and stuff in. Yeah. I think it's the seam around the top is probably why there's sound coming out of there. It's just exactly where I sit. Like that. You just hear it. The wine from those R drives goes fucking all day just long. Put a little pillow on top of it. Yeah, you know, muffle that out. I've, I've thought about trying to buy some aftermarket like sound dampening material to line the case further with, even though the case has some built in. But yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how effective that would actually be. I I think you're probably better off um, trying to figure out how to isolate those. My guess is that there's probably something resonating on the hard drives to the case that's making it louder than it would be otherwise. That is, that so is if possible. You put some like rubber grommets or something, or put a little rubber shim in between the the drives and the and the the bays. Yeah, I don't know. That might they, help. Yeah, they are all on grommets, so I don't know if. Hmm. Yeah, there's something about because I was not hearing this with the same drives in my old case. But the real solution is to move somewhere else where I can put that computer in a room where I don't sit. Yeah, my my NAS is in the garage. And yes. I, I, I only hear it when I'm out working on laundry, and it turns out it's fine. That's it. Home servers belong in the basement. Yeah, I wish That's I had a basement. Is what I say. Basement would be cool. Yes. Um, let's see. There is a question here from Warbird that I wanted to read if I could find it. I did. Did we congratulate the person who said they built their first PC at the start of the show? I did. Okay. Congratulations. That's awesome. By the way, I yeah. think I forgot to say that. I meant to say that, and that's rad. I'm always glad when somebody yeah. new builds a PC. That's that's yes. fantastic. That is you're, exciting. You've entered a larger world. Although, actually, I mean, not to get all next lander over here, we were talking about Phil Spencer's GDC interview with Polygon this week, mm-hmm. and they linked to a study that, like, a big part of the reason that consoles are dying effectively is because everybody under the age of 21 just uses PCs now. Yeah, this is it's, it's funny. It's I had insane. the same conversation in other places too. Yeah, like it's crazy to think back to the like early Steam days, the PC games are dying era. You know? Yeah, you shit of, consoles. Th- <laughs> think about how thoroughly the PC has won in the end. I mean, w- the PC won't win until Mario's releasing Nintendo games on Steam. I suppose that's true, but that's the that's the last holdout. Well, it's it's gonna be PCs and, and Switch. It's gonna be PCs and Nintendo at the end of this whole thing. I don't know. Uh, I think I feel like I feel like Sony's going to keep selling PlayStations for a minute. Yeah, no, it, they'll be fine for a while. But it's still it is still crazy to me to think that that specifically that demographic, the younger demographic, is all all in on the computer. My daughter has a Switch and is and a PC. That's all she needs. I yeah, I offered yeah. her a full ass Xbox, and she was like, "No, nah, I'm good, Dad." Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um. All right. Question from Warbird. Um. With uh, the new focus of Microsoft on having their games run in more places, the ongoing success of Sony properties on PC, and the continued efforts of the Proton team to get apps not made for Linux to play nice on the Steam Deck, do we think Mac OS may ever see first-class support that they don't have to pay for? Uh, Which is to ask, do we think that all the work being done to make everything run on mostly everything else will result in the opportunity cost in doing Mac ports being low enough that more companies will bother? So. I don't think people are going to do Mac ports, but I think that what will happen, it probably is already happening. We don't even, I don't even know about it, but I bet that there's a proton fork for Mac. I think if, if, if Apple was still on, uh, x86, this would have already happened. Yes. It would be done. But I think yeah, the was... arm to x86 to windows, to Linux, to Mac is like maybe one jump further than is going to be easy for the time being. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like the, you know, the, the DXVK stuff you see on P well, step back. The thing with Linux and windows going from windows to Linux is you're still on the same hardware. You're still in yeah. the same box. You're just running a different operating system. But with Macs being universally arm based these days, yeah. Like the machine code translation, as you see with Rosetta has got performance and like battery, you know, power usage implications. I think that's probably 
asking a little bit much. That said, not only are you not wrong that Apple has something like that, like it's known, it's it's out there. Uh, this got announced during WWDC last year, last summer, the game porting toolkit. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. I don't know if it incorporates Proton or it might be Wine. I would bet I it's probably it, Wine. Yes, it is Wine. In fact, it would have been early. For, well, maybe not. They did not work with code weavers, um, but they were involved in some way. Anyway, I don't, I don't remember all the details, but like Apple, Apple does have some like middleware stuff out there uh, for people to potentially try to get games brought over. So I mean, maybe we've, we've talked about this before, but like adding new SKUs to games to support is a, like, I didn't fully appreciate how time consuming and expensive it is until I actually started working on the game studio and, and I was like, Oh God, when we had an Epic build, we got to add, we got to add more build servers, which we've got to get more licenses for these five things, which is going to cost us X number of thousand dollars a year. And when you're looking at like the success of PC games ported to Mac and they're selling like tens of hundreds of copies, it, it, it will literally take something like the, the, somebody has to build a market there and I think it has to be Apple because they're going to have to subsidize. Like, if only Apple had money to subsidize games, if they cared about games as a, on, a, on a, you know on on their Mac platform, we would probably have games on the Mac. Like, Valve has effectively subsidized games on Linux by building the Steam Deck and making it fucking rad. Yeah, and putting a lot of work into Proton and, and stuff like that. An insane amount of work into Proton and and DXVK and all the stuff around that. Yeah. Uh, let's do two more real quick ones and then get out of here. Uh, question from cake batter. Hmm, cake batter, eh? Yes. Sorry, I had to pull it up real quick. You ever wonder what antivirus software would be like if John McAfee wasn't a weird criminal who fled to a country with no extradition treaty and lived on a yacht and then died? No. <laughs> You're good. I, I mean, he was not involved with the antivirus software for a decade by the yeah, time he, all that happened. Yeah, like he divested, didn't he? He just got rich and went off to he live. He sold it to the, Intel or somebody, I think, right? Live, live his vision quest. Who owns McAfee? I don't know. I, I it, w- it went to Intel, I think, for a minute. I don't know who owns it now. I feel like the like in a, in a weird way, Microsoft kind of Sherlocked antivirus for Windows because Defender is real good. Yes, and I could not be happier that they did that. I know they should, you know, like they should have done that and probably sooner. Like it's it's entirely appropriate that they went and built their own solution for that because like their platform lives and dies by its security integrity, right? Yeah, and the other ones universally sucked in some important way yeah I mean, yeah i don't even think about yeah. it anymore defender just kind of does its thing i i will if i'm downloading something i'm like oh man this is questionable i check and make sure defender is oh, up sure. to date and then i right click and scan it yes 100 percent. yeah uh speaking of screensavers i found a um Ooh. you know you know the classic starfield simulation oh hell yeah I, I went and got a 4k video of that and used that as my stream background now <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> which people every gets comments every week does Dude, Windows but, even have screensavers built in uh, anymore? Yeah, it's got a few. That one is not in there, but um, oh. it's got uh, Mystify is still in there. Uh, the 3D text one. Remember that old OpenGL 3D text screensaver? Oh, that yeah. Is, that one is that, still that's in there. A banger. Um, hang on. Let me pull it up. There's like wow. five more. Let's see. It's when Mystify. I, okay. So when I open this bubbles. up, the preview window, which I think just took a screenshot of what I was on my desktop at the time and then put it on a, on a four by three it looks like crt frame so it's all mm-hmm. squinched in because i have a 16 by 9 monitor it's amazing yes pretty good also the windows screensaver dialogue is the same it, it has been since uh at least windows 95 if not 3.1 i think this is windows i think this is a windows 95 one i don't this um, doesn't look like a windows 3.1 one like the, the little preview window is still a crt uh oh ribbons man rib, ribbons bubbles mystify photos and 3d text are this, your that's all that's left this brings me back uh i use uh I use Mystify if you're curious. Anyway, the reason I brought that up was I went out and found some um, some much more advanced new Starfield simulation screensaver that some guy wrote in .NET, but it's not hosted on GitHub. It's not oh on boy. anything remotely reputable. It is on a very like 20 year old looking website that he posted it on. Is it and in a .ru? Because that's always a good sign. No, but then I clicked I clicked back to the the root page and like there's a bunch of like somewhat extreme political screeds in between the software he has posted. You should go work for Basecamp. And uh, 
I have not. I have yet to run. It's a really cool Starfield simulation thing, but I have yet to run it. And I guess I, I defendered the hell out of that thing when I downloaded it. Um, all right. Last email. I'm assuming you have. A, I've never crimped a cable in my life, but I assume oh. you you bolded this, so you must have an opinion. Oh, I, I I have one more I want to do too. Then. Oh, okay. Well, before what's what's yours then? I'm a hundred percent. Oh, you want to do mine first? Okay. Uh, Defectus wants to know: Do you wear shoes inside the house slash oh. apartment? If so, why? Here across the pond, it's not very common, and the common perception is that all Americans wear shoes indoors. Last time I asked the question on the internet, I got because it's my goddamn right as an answer, which is good and all, but hoping to get a more insightful answer from you guys. I'm guessing we have very similar answers because we're from we are from the same part of the country and now both live in the same part of the country. I but was not ever exposed to taking your shoes off in the house until yeah. I moved to California. Yeah, no, like where where we are both from, people just wear shoes in the house constantly, but like, they don't they don't live in cities. Well, I'm not, okay. I'm not defending it. To be clear, I'm not defending it. I, I think it's terrible. I so, like every so, time every time I go home now, I feel <laughs> weird as hell. Okay, so I, I have complicated feelings on this. There's a cultural component here because my understanding is that it, like the reason people in California are often not shoe wears in the house is because we have a lot of people from Asia that live here. Yes. And it is, it is a taking your shoes off of the house. Like there's there's a whole mechanism. There's like rat, shoe racks in the whole nine yards mm -hmm. by the by the door often. Uh, in fact, actually, a lot of our houses here even have like little nooks where you can put the shoe rack where it lives outside. Um, like in sunset, a lot of the sunset houses are just built that way. Yeah. Mud rooms. Yeah. Um, I have had a dog in the house for a pretty, pretty big chunk of the last 50, 20 years. And I feel like if the dog's walking around outside and has to, gets to keep her feet on, it doesn't really do a whole lot of good for me to take my shoes off. Sure. Um, and I have arch problems, so I often have to wear some sort of something with arch support in the house or else I'll hurt my feet. But yeah, I think not wearing shoes in the house is, is nice. Yes, I fully agree. Yes, we are a strict no shoes in the house house here. I feel like I would have more slip ons, though. Yeah, I have some now. I've got there's a pair of flip flops and a pair of slip on laceless sketchers right by the door. Well, hold on. Are your flip flops all do you have do you have like inside the house shoes, too, though? Or you just walk around in socks all day? Uh, bare, barefoot. I, God, I, would, I would a my feet would be freezing cold all the time. And yeah, B, kind of. I would have hurdy feet. Yeah, I don't know. I love being barefoot. I love it. I have inside the house slippers. Then I also have some slippers that I wear outside the house. Sometimes I have taken the dog out. Yeah. Some, some house slippers would probably be nice. Um, but yeah, I like, I, for me, it's not a grossness thing. It's just like, you know, I'm not eating off the floor. Yeah. I mean, I live in San Francisco. Like for me, it is largely a grossness thing. <laughs> like the, Fair. Spend enough time walking around here and you'll be like, you know what? I probably shouldn't wear these shoes I'm wearing on this sidewalk in my house. Yeah. I mean, there was that poo or something else. The answer to either of those questions is it's bad. You don't yeah. want to have it in your house. And I think that goes for really any major city. I think that's probably true. Uh, see, Seattle and Vancouver both seem very clean. Yeah. All right. Last question. Okay. Again, I don't have an answer for this, but you bolded it. So Neuroflare, what's the official tech pod twisted pair termination standard? T568A or T568B? This is a strict T568A podcast. Okay. Do you have any, is there a rationale for that that I can cite? Uh, the rationale is that when I set it up, I didn't know what the difference in them was when I did my first cables. So I just did whatever the A one was because that seemed like the right one. And it has to match both ends, I'm sure. Both ends have to match, but yes. you can mix and match A and B cables and they'll work fine. I see. I, uh, I did not know... Uh, when I when I did the I reterminated some ends a few years ago, a year and a half ago, I guess now, and I had to open up the wall to look and see what I had done because I could not remember. So now I've written it down and it's written on a post-it note that's attached to the switch in the garage. So I'll remember that's good, that's good. for future cables. Is this going to be one of those things where like 50 years from now, whoever buys your house is going to be remodeling? And they're going to knock a wall down and find where you <laughs> find where you wrote the, the termination standard. For no network cables on the inside of a wall or something. Nope. I'm not going to tell them they have to figure it out. Like yeah. I did. Yeah. Uh, uh, for so yeah, that's, that, that's, that's just the like wiring diagram. It's just which colors go to which terminals basically. Right. Yeah. So when you do, we talked about it in the network episode a little bit last week, but when you do, when you, whether you're crimping a cable or putting a push down connector on a socket, there are two basic standards. And the idea is that either for T five, six, eight, a, Green and white is one. Green is two. Orange and white is three. Uh, blue solid is four. Blue Ooh. and white is five. 
six is orange seven is brown and white and eight is brown yeah the I, i'm looking at this the blues and orange i'm sorry the blues and browns never move it's just all it does is invert the greens and oranges yeah and i think that the greens and the oranges are the only ones that um carry the data on most ethernet also that would so, make sense. um so yeah all you're doing is switching the switching the the which which ones are which the greens and the oranges and um that's it it has to do with the all the all of the different pairs are the colored pairs are twisted together at different uh ratios and that it has to do with that if you want to make a null hold on what's it called not a not a null, null, null modem cable is it a null modem cable no that's a serial cable it's oh. a um it's a crossover cable is what it's called crossover, on Ethernet. yes uh then you just switch one the pairs on one end so one end is a and one end is b but you don't really have to do that anymore because most ethernet uh Ethernet devices are automatically crossovering if it detects that you have a non crossover cable. Brad just hung up on me. I'm going to keep talking for a second, though. I feel like this is a, probably a pretty good time for me to talk about the fact that you should use ports instead of using plugs where you can because it's better and easier. And I think uh, on that is as good a place as any to to call it an episode, Mr. Shoemaker. Mm, yeah, I'll agree with that. I feel like we turned a. Uh, I don't know what the standard number of Q's we turn into A's is on every Q and A episode. Do we have a quota? I don't know. I, I I would I would love to know from our listeners if they feel like we have done an adequate job making A's out of Q's. Frankly, I mean, I we could have gone for another hour. There's a bunch more in here. We we have a bunch more questions. Um, if you would like to send a, uh, if you would like to send a Q into an A, and a Q to be turned into an A. You can send that email to techbot at content.town, or even better, you can join the Patreon and jump into the Discord channel and post a queue into the queue seeking A's channel because Brand Will Made a Techbot is a 100% listener supported podcast. Without your support, we would not be here. True. I re- especially appreciate it right now when I don't really have other income coming in. So mm-hmm. thanks everyone for, uh, for uh, jumping in there and, and supporting the pod. Uh, it helps me continue to you know eat food. Mm-hmm. I've had that thought many times, you know, it's like, boy, if this thing keeps going, it would be a nice fallback just in case everything else explodes. Yeah. So, yeah, you can go to patreon.com slash tech pod. Again, that's patreon.com slash tech pod. And we're for five bucks a month. You get access to the discord. You get access to the the fabulous. It's a fabulous community in there. People are, are always sharing very generous with their knowledge and time and just kind of hanging out and having fun. There's a whole contingent of folks who just like hop into voice and hang out. I think it's a lot of people who work from home or, or work in kind of solitary jobs and they're just hanging out and chatting about whatever is interesting on any given day, which is, mm-hmm. which is, I think a lovely kind of thing that spontaneously happened in there recently. Um, and then also you get the Patreon exclusive episode this month. We talked about, I mean, we talked about kind of stuff that's going on right now, different projects we're working on as, as is often the case. Uh, but yeah, it's patreon.com slash tech pod. And uh, we appreciate everyone's support, but it's the end of the month, so in addition to supporting our executive producer tier patrons, we're also going to support, uh, rec- recognize our associate producer tier patrons. Uh, so starting with the executives, we would like to thank Andrew Slosky, Bunny Crims. I think that's Bunny Crimes. I heard, I heard all the vowels got dropped. <laughs> yeah, the vowels got dropped. Uh, it's very Web 2.0. Uh, Paddle Creek Games, makers of Fractured Veil, David Allen, James Kamek, Joel Krauska, Jordan Lippett, Just Wedge, Twinkle Twinkie, and Pantheon, makers of the HS3 high-speed high 3D printer. Thank you all so, so much. Yeah, thank you. And we also want to uh, thank our associate producer to your patrons, including Alejandro Navarro, Andre M. Burke, Andrew Dicey Schuldeis, Arthur Geese, Ben Tallman, Eric, Eric Klein, Felix Kramer, Graham Banks, Jad Rita, Matt Walker, parentheses Walkman 8080, close parentheses, Mike Etheridge, Nathan Phelps, Sanchik Kumar, Steve Lynn, Thomas Shea and Tom Hilton. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, we appreciate everyone's support. Could not do it without you. Seems like the Eric's, some Eric's are coming out ahead in the great Eric Wars. So mm. we're, we're losing Eric's again, which is fine. You know, to every season there is an Eric is what I always say. <laughs> yes, wise words. Uh, and that'll do it for us this week. We will be back next week with another edition of the TechPod. I think we know what we're going to talk about already. We do. We, we have gotten ahead of a topic. I don't remember what it was. I do. Should I say it? Yeah, yeah but then we're committed. Yeah, you're, that's actually, that's a good point. Then we really will hold our feet to the fire. We're talking yeah. about doing a short history of home video formats. That's right. That's the one, the short history of home video formats. I looked at the list of ideas 
And I went down it today. I was like, I need to start reading about this. And I couldn't remember which one and you were streaming. So I didn't want to bug you. But anyway, uh, that'll be next week. Short history of home video formats. Send your favorite video formats into us and we'll we'll talk about them, learn about them and, and uh, share some knowledge. Hey, folks, Brad coming to you here uh, from the future, at least the future since we recorded this episode uh, with a little addendum because uh, some of our episode plans actually are a little bit in flux uh, since we recorded this. Two notes. Uh, the big one that we forgot to mention is, uh, I think we've alluded to this in the past, but we will definitely be doing an episode on Pirates of Silicon Valley, the 1999 made-for-TV classic uh, about the early days of Apple and Microsoft, uh, Noah Wiley uh, as Steve Jobs, and I believe Anthony Michael Hall of uh, Breakfast Club fame as Bill Gates. If you haven't seen it, it's a certified banger. And it's on archive.org. It's uh, it's not easy to find on streaming. It got very limited home video releases. It was made for cable, as I said. It originally aired on the TNT network. But anyway, it is on archive.org, and I will link uh, that movie in the show notes for this. We are talking about doing that movie for the episode that will run on April 21st. It might be the 14th. We're not quite sure yet. Um, but uh, I wanted to give people a heads up uh, so they'd have time to watch it uh, in advance. It'll be the 14th or the 21st uh, that we'll probably be recording that. Also, next week might not be home video formats because this insane security breach has happened in the open source world with uh, XZ, the compression utility, uh, lib LZMA, big compression library that basically every Linux distro on the planet uh, depends on. And there has been a completely insane backdoor that has been discovered that may have been implanted by a nation state actor this is shaping up to be maybe the biggest backdoor security breach in modern history, or at least it's really up there. Um, it's a crazy story. We might do the episode next week about that, or maybe the week after, depending on what further news and evidence comes to light on that subject as people dig into it. So, um, yeah, anyway, so open source security breaches, home video formats, Pirates of Silicon Valley. There's the next like three weeks of tech pods coming at you. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.